Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives, where you can listen to every episode we've ever done, going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is November 14th, 2016, and my guest is Terry Anderson, Distinguished Senior Fellow at the Property and Environment Research Center, known as PERC, and Senior Fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution. He's the author of numerous books on environmental issues and is one of the founders of the free market environmentalism movement. He appeared on Econ Talk in August of 2014, talking about the environment and property rights. Today, we're going to talk about the past and present economic situation of Native Americans and Indian nations. Terry, welcome back to Econ Talk. It's always great to be with you, Russ. Now, how did you come to be interested in this topic? I grew up in Montana uh, and uh, lived oh, about 50 miles from the Crow Indian Reservation. As a result, uh, once in a while, we would travel through the reservation or in high school, you might be on a sports team that played a team from from the Crow Reservation. And one thing we knew is that Indians were poor and that somehow they were separated from the rest of society out onto these these uh, pretty remote places in Montana and, of course, elsewhere in the West. And then uh, when I was in my uh, oh, 12 to 14 years old, my uncle managed a large ranch on the Blackfeet Reservation near Glacier Park, and I, I spent uh, my summers there every summer and, didn't, and, and got to know uh, many of the uh, Blackfeet people who worked on the ranch, and I always say my favorite cowboy was Francis Calf-Looking. He was a Blackfeet uh, tribal member who who was the head of all the wrangling of horses and moving of cows, and and asked me to work uh, cows with him. And he really taught me all I know about horseback riding, which maybe isn't much. But uh, in that, those two experiences, I, I left as a, di- a child just thinking, well, these are different people. They live on these remote reservations, and, and they're poor. And never thought any more about it until uh, economics warped my mind. <laughs> the scope of the population is something I really didn't have an awareness of until I read some of your essays on the topic. How many reservations are there in the United States and what's the pop- Native American population uh, on those reservations? Well, th- there are over 500 reservations, some of which are quite small. Uh, some some are quite large. Uh, I was recently on the Fort Peck Reservation in northeastern Montana, two, 2.1 million acres. The Navajo is is a huge reservation, and then you have others that are postage stamps, uh, and they're generally in urban areas, and they're the ones where there are casinos. There are almost three million American Indians registered as tribal members. That's roughly the population of Kansas. So uh, it's 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 an easily ignored minority for two reasons: it's not a huge minority, and they are scattered uh, around in these remote places. In the remote places, and let's talk about out in the West, which where the reservations are much larger, talk about the population density and, and what life looks like. Does it look like – if I, I confess I've never been on a reservation. Would I see a small town? Would I see uh, homesteads scattered around? What's the – and is there a way to generalize? Maybe there's no way at all. Well, I might ask, have you ever been in a third world country in a small town? And if your answer is yes, uh, I would say you have a pretty good picture of what many of these reservation towns are like. Uh, let me start with Crow Agency. It's the uh, headquarters for the Crow Tribe in south central Montana. I was there this summer visiting with the Crow Tribal Chairman and touring their big coal mine. Uh, Crow Agency is a... a a rundown community with substandard buildings. Uh, the the tribal headquarters is a, a bureaucratic looking building that was probably built in the oh perhaps fifties. Uh, when you walk inside, it's uh, old metal desks that you think of in in uh, of old bureaucratic buildings, and and you think you probably would find in Cuba today. Uh, there are many people just milling around. Uh, 
the, the town itself is has a couple of little tiny grocery stores and and uh, of course bars and liquor stores, which is uh, we can come back and talk about some of the problems with alcohol and drugs. But uh, so it's 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 amazing just how poor these places are. I uh, after my childhood experience in uh, on the Blackfeet Reservation, I went to a little town called Browning, probably when I was. 50, so a different different set of glasses on at that point, and I was just shocked at how how much more rundown it was compared to my memory. There were stray dogs everywhere, uh, so they're just you know they're really run down. And then if you talk about how scattered is the population, if you drive around a reservation, you find these individual parcels that came out of a, a, a law in 1887, the Dawes Act or the Allotment Act. And this allotted small parcels of lands to individual Indians, starting uh, most of them 160 acres. Uh, they're held in trust by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, so they're not really like you own your house. They're, they're uh, like your parents left you a trust fund, but you have a trustee who tells you whether you can spend it or use it. So there are these small parcels. They have incredibly run down structures on them. They're not, the land isn't uh, very productive because there's no way to invest in it. And it, you, you drive along and, and, and on the reservation, there are some some privately owned fee simple lands. And as you drive through, you, you will come to a fence line and one side will be what I just described, this, this small parcel, a hovel for a house. Uh, and I'm, I'm not being pejorative here. I'm, I'm simply describing there might be four or five wrecked cars. Uh, uh, and then on the other side of the fence can be a beautifully cultivated field with, a, with an irrigation system, a barn, a tractor, nice house. And and it just captures the contract, contrast between what I see as a sort of islands of poverty and a sea of wealth. What kind of economic life is there on the reservation right now? Is there a way to generalize about outside the casinos where I assume some significant portion of economic life is driven by the casino? But again, in Western lands, which are quite – some of which are quite large, is there economic activity? Is there work? Is there – uh, some, what's the nature of the economy? Mm -hmm. The juxtaposition between casinos and, and Western reservations is, is dramatic indeed. Uh, people in the East have probably more experience with going into these large casinos and, and they generate a lot of income. Casinos in the West, of course, are, are in remote places where there's nobody to gamble, so they don't generate much income. Uh, the typical life on a reservation is is for people to be unemployed, milling around. Uh, their unemployment rates are are incredibly high. Uh, uh, Sixty-eight percent of of uh, American Indians on reservations uh, have uh, household incomes that are are significantly below the U.S. average. Uh, Twenty percent of households make less than five thousand annually. Uh, compared to 6% for the overall uh, U.S. population. 25% uh, is below the poverty level, 15% uh, for the nation as a whole. Uh, it, it's just amazing how much unemployment there is. And, and you see it on the streets. Uh, I was on the Fort Peck Reservation recently in, in the little town of, of uh, uh, Wolf Point. And uh, young teenagers just hanging around, uh, as you might find in in more ghetto areas in 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 urban U.S., uh, uh, people people are poor, and uh, there's just not much hope of jobs. Uh, what when there are uh, claims of economic development, it's a government grant that has subsidized the. Uh, creation of an electronics firm on a reservation. I use that example again, the Fort Peck Reservation in northeastern Montana. And I mean, this is this is seven hours from where I live. Uh, that's how far and remote it is. Uh, here was an industrial park with streets running every direction, one building in the middle of it, and it was this electronics firm. I have no idea even what they produce. Uh, and they start and they fold, uh, and that's kind of economic life on these Western Western reservation. One exception, and we can chat more about this, is energy. Uh, 
the the Navajo, the Southern Ute, uh, the Crow, to to a large extent, have huge energy reserves. And if they can develop those, then it provides jobs, it provides income for the tribe, tribal government, and provides royalties to individual tribal members. So that's an exception on the reservations that have oil, gas, and coal. So let's go back to the. We will come back to the present, but I want let's go on and start with the now with the past. Uh, before Europeans arrived in North America, what kind of economic institutions did Native Americans have? There, there's a lot of romance about the Native American population, and uh, I think a lot of ignorance, uh, which certainly I have. But uh, I'm, I tend not toward the romantic in this area. So tell us what we know. Um, about those populations and how they interacted with with each other and um, across across tribes. My interest in in reservation economy started with more modern times, but as an economic historian, I couldn't help but look back at at every turn and and ask uh, how was it before and how was it before. Uh, the government entered into wars with Indians. How was it before Indians were put on reservations? How was it before Columbus arrived? And each of those backward looks uh, taught me just how uh, innovative and uh, Native Americans were and how how well they created and adapted institutions to fit their resource constraints. Uh, so let's, let's, uh, there's a wonderful book by Charles Mann. He's perhaps been interviewed by you called 1491. I recommend it to all listeners, uh, looking back at, at the new world, obviously the year before Columbus arrived. And he, he documents much of this, but, it, but let's start with the, the, the Eastern seaboard. Uh, most of the tribes on the East were sedentary. They had well-defined property rights to land. It was clear which family or clan owned a piece of land. They cultivated that land. They grew their corn. They grew their grain crops. uh, They grew their their various uh, pumpkins and so on. Uh, And and they were very productive that way. Uh, If you move to the West Coast, the the tribes on the West Coast had a fascinating case of clam gardens. I read a book by an anthropologist who studied how uh, Northwest Coast Indians actually manipulated the rocks and sand on beaches to create more clam production. And these beaches, these clam gardens were, again, owned by a family or clan. They had every incentive to take care of it, and they were very productive. Many of the smaller salmon streams in the uh, on the West Coast were owned by clans and families. And interestingly, what happened on those is when the salmon came up to spawn, they took the small salmon and let the large ones go up to spawn, reckoning that there would be bigger fish later on. And to this day, some of those streams that had private uh, ownership, if you will, still produce bigger salmon because they had bigger salmon stock to start with. Uh, Bruce Johnson at George Mason has done some wonderful research on this topic. Switch to the Plains Indians. They were nomadic. They moved around. They didn't have property rights to land. Uh, they they had some property rights to hunting territories, but they had very clear property rights to their personal property. Teepees were individually owned, bows and arrows individually owned, and this reflects the kind of investment that had to go into producing uh, these pieces of, of personal property. Uh, I'm an archer, and I I have a very, very expensive uh, $1,000 bow uh, that shoots carbon arrows that cost about $25 each and steel tips on them. And I like to think of how that compares to the cost of a bow to a a Plains Indian who had to go out and find the right kind of wood and maybe laminate it with other woods and use rattlesnake skins to uh, add resilience to it. Find a straight piece of wood for an arrow and chip a a point out of a a piece of uh, obsidian. And you imagine that kind of investment. Clearly, they had private property rights to to reward the person who made that investment. They also had, you know, they also had uh, specialization. Some people were better at making arrowhead points, and some were better at making arrows, and they traded. Uh, so, so they had institutions that worked very well. Uh, coming forward, even to the reservation age, the the Blackfeet. Uh, 
were a, a, a nomadic tribe. They herded their horses uh, when they got them. Again, this would be, of course, after Europeans. They herded their horses communally. Made no sense for each person to herd three horses, so it would be your night to watch the hundred horses in the herd or whatever. So when they were put on the Blackfeet reservation, they said, well, let's do that with cattle. We'll each get a few cows. The cows will belong to us individually, but we'll herd them communally. They they started to become productive. They exported uh, beef to the Great Northern Railroad, which was being built at the time right along their reservation. So they uh, Native Americans were incredibly innovative when it came to producing institutions that, that worked for them. And I, I think you quote – I think it's from Lewis and Clark's expedition, their report to Thomas Jefferson that – they found the the Indians to be very entrepreneurial, uh, very in, interested in trade, and tell the story of the axe and how it got ahead of them. <laughs> That's fascinating. Uh, one of one of my favorite stories, actually pointed out to me by my, by my good friend Bill Yellowtail, a Crow tribal member, and he loves the story too. Uh, well, first uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition spent its first mem- uh, first winter in the Mandan villages in what is now North Dakota. The Mandan villages were a trading node. They were kind of the the, the Singapore, the, the the New York City, uh, a place where where people congregated to do trade. So people all the way from the West Coast would come to the Mandan villages with with seashells and uh, uh, dried salmon to trade with. Uh, Minnesota Indians who had beautiful pipestone that they could use to make their uh, smoking pipes, uh, and and when they came together in these these trading places, they they understood trade amongst themselves. But uh, Lewis and Clark recognized, well, this was a real possible way of of making contact with the people they would see. So Lewis and Clark had a blacksmith along, and he built trade axes. This was quite common for the traders in the West in the early days to have goods that were marked with their symbol. In this case, the Corps of Discovery had its symbol marked onto these axes. They traded these axes for other things that they needed, food, uh, horses, and so on. So now we ratchet forward. That's the first winter they spent the next spring, summer, and fall trying to get from middle of North Dakota all the way across to the West Coast. And they finally arrive on the West Coast in the late fall, and uh, they get to what is now Fort Clatsop at the mouth of the Columbia. And lo and behold, there is one of the trade axes already there. It wasn't delivered by FedEx, but it was a matter of that trade axe finding its way probably traded from one person to another until it beat them all the way across the area they were they were discovering. It's so cool. So the point of, of all that is that the the Native Americans in advance of the um European arrival certainly had institutions of trade, specialization, private property, the things that we associate with the potential for economic growth and their their they of course didn't have all the technology that the West had. They didn't have everything that the West had, but they had a, a, what appears to be a thriving economic system. Absolutely. And, and you know, there were a few tribes that were really quite uh, poor. Uh, there a, was a band of Shoshone in the area around Yellowstone called the Sheep Eaters. And all the early photographs of them uh, show them as being quite for poor. They they depended on bighorn sheep, hence the name. But but think about the, the art that – um, if you've ever been to a museum and looked at uh, uh, beaded moccasins or or the ledger art, which Indians uh, were famous for, ledger art was an art form uh, on the on the reservations. After they had no hides to paint, they would collect ledger books from the local trading post and tear pages out and do their drawings. And their ledger art is spectacular. Uh, same with the, the the beautiful decorations on. On their uh, uh, paraflesias, they're called uh, essentially suitcases. So you know they they had enough uh, wealth to have time to invest in art, and I think that alone suggests that they were a prosperous economy. Uh, they were they were when they got the horse, they were they were the people who really made the horse what it is today in the West, and and they did it by training, they did it by selective breeding. So, you know, by all accounts, they were a, a sophisticated people, 
of course, with different institutions as you went from east to west, it went from sedentary to nomadic, uh, went from uh, take take the southwest, where where very arid country. Uh, there, they had uh, fantastic irrigation systems, and the fields were privately owned, but the irrigation systems were owned collectively, and everybody had to contribute to investing in in making these. Uh, digging these ditches and delivering the water communally and then dividing the water up as it came along to the various fields. So if you if you backed away and described this and said, where do you think this is? Most people wouldn't see it as a, a, a pre-Columbian picture. They would see it as a more modern one. And I think it suggests, again, just what a rich institutional history Native Americans had. So let's go from um, Thanksgiving – the first Thanksgiving, which we're we're coming up on the holiday, and it'll this episode will probably air just after Thanksgiving or a few weeks after. But Thanksgiving, when I went to school, was this love fest between um, people with buckles on their shoes and goofy hats, the pilgrims, and the friendly primitive um, Indians who brought their their maize their corn and and swapped with the with the pilgrims or at least actually not swapped shared and created this beautiful communal meal uh, we went from that to uh gruesome war and uh, death lots of death and essentially the exclusion of of the american indian from certainly much of modern life but even of course their own past so how what what happened there? Uh, we don't have sixteen hours, but um, give us a quick thumbnail of, of why of what's relevant about that history for for the present. Well, being an economist like you, I think of it in terms of benefits and costs of of interaction with people. And so, try to imagine you're one of the first pilgrims to step off the boat. You're just thankful you made it across the ocean. You're now on land. Well, or on a rock, uh, and uh, you meet up with these natives who maybe are a little bit hostile. They're certainly skeptical. They've never seen anybody quite like you. Uh, you're going to be pretty nice to them, <laughs> and you're going to give them things, trade with them if you need to. But you're going to be very nice to them, and and they look at it from their side and say, "Ah, oh, well, it's just a couple of people getting off a boat. They're pretty strange, but uh, there's no reason to be hostile towards them." And and so you get the Thanksgiving <laughs> picture. And I think that captures a good portion of the early history of not many Europeans showing up, lots of land available, uh, good reason to engage in, in cooperation. Time goes on, however, and you get more and more of these boats arriving and more and more people, more pressure on the lands. And sure, there's a whole continent out there, but that's not very relevant when you're uh, on horseback uh, with a wagon, perhaps, and uh, you're trying to cut a swath through the woods. So the rest of the continent isn't uh, isn't open to you. Uh, and so there began to be some some potential conflicts over who got to use the land. Most of that in the in the 1600s and 1700s was resolved by people saying, "Can we buy some land from you?" And there documents after document after uh, showing these these sw trading of of property rights to land for other things, uh, and some people would move to places that weren't settled. So uh, this this was clearly a cooperative kind of of, of uh, arrangement. Uh, and furthermore, if you think about benefits and costs, if you were going to fight the Indians, you had to get together with your uncle, your sons, a uh, few of your neighbors and say, let's take them on. But they knew the land. The Indians did. They had far superior weapons, a bow and arrow compared com uh, compared to an old blunderbuss <laughs> was uh, hardly a, a, a match. An Indian could shoot 25 arrows before you could reload. Uh, so most of the early uh, uh, era, as Fred McChesney, a friend of yours and mine, an economist, a law, law professor, we wrote about it in the context of raid or trade. And we, we argued that the early part of this history was one of trading. But something happened, uh, obviously, in the 19th century when we went from this trading and relatively peaceful uh, engagement engagements between the the Europeans and the Indians to to raiding. And the argument Fred and I uh, have and document with data is that the big turning point was the creation of a standing army after the Spanish-American War and then especially with the Civil War. Uh, 
Once you have a standing army, the costs and benefits of raiding versus trading change. Now you don't have to get your sons and uncles and so on to fight. You call on General George Armstrong Custer, noting, however, that he was really a lieutenant colonel and the general rank was a brevet rank if he was fighting, first in the Civil War and then later fighting Indians. And so what Fred and I find is that the number of of uh, of battles, uh, hence the Indian Wars of the late 19th century, were really a result of the standing army that was looking for something to do. And you imagine you've been sent out to Fort Kehoe in eastern Montana, uh, and you're living in this dusty, hot place in the summer. You're bored. You're you're 20 years old. You're pretty full of t- t- testosterone, and you're uh, looking for something fun to do. And somebody says, "Hey, the Indians burned a homestead over there," and so off you go. Uh, so it was the standing army that really made the change, of course, uh, with the Gatling gun, repeating rifles, and so on arriving. Uh, it meant that, that the standing army was able to defeat these Indians, and the rest, as they say, is history. They were put onto reservations, uh, and land was taken from them right and left as, as uh, their territories were whittled down. And those those reservations were... Um... Well, let me ask a more basic question. In 1890, what rights did a a Native American on a reservation have? Could they vote? Could they leave the reservation freely? Could they move? Could they you know, buy land somewhere else, property? Do you know? Yeah. Great, great question. Uh, well, and, and the simple answer is they had very few rights in 1890. Uh, once, once the Indians were defeated, they were uh, – brought into these reservations. Uh, they were usually rounded up and put into villages near a fort. Uh, eventually that fort would become a, a headquarters for a reservation. Uh, and and they were told, stay here. And of course, you know, they'd been, the Plains Indians in particular had been hunting buffalo and now you're stuck in one place. Uh, you're not going to get much buffalo meat. So the army supplied the food and and we all know the stories of blankets infested with smallpox that killed huge numbers of of the Indians at that time. Uh, and back to the Blackfeet, for example, some of the reservations, uh, Indi- Indians rather, said, well, what are we going to do? And the Blackfeet said, well, let's get some cattle. But many of them had had no tradition of of, of cattle raising, so they, that wasn't a possibility. Uh, and they couldn't move. If they moved, the concern was, oh, it's an Indian uprising, and so the, the cavalry would round them back up and put them on reservations. Uh, and, and so they basically had no rights. The one thing that happened, though, in the late 19th century, 1887, the passage of uh, what I mentioned before, the Dawes Act or Allotment Act, and this was uh, ostensibly an effort by Congress to uh, to make American Indians uh, good Jeffersonian yeoman farmers. We'll give them each 160 acres on their reservation. Uh, That'll be their little piece, little homestead, if you will. And and, uh, they'll live there and they'll learn to farm. And we'll we'll send people out to teach them how to farm. But the argument was they're not, not my words, the words in in the legislation, they're not competent yet. And so we'll hold this land in trust for 25 years until the Indian is deemed competent by the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Just imagine those words applied to any minority group, and yet that law persists, and if an Indian were to try to get his or her land out of trusteeship, would have to have the government deem him or her competent. Incredible. Uh, So they got these little pieces of land, uh, and along came white settlement, and white settlers said, well, you know, that's some of that's pretty good land. We'd like it. And two things happened. One, they would go to the BIA agent and he would say, okay, uh, this uh, member of the uh, Crow tribe is deemed competent. And then that member would sell the land to the white settler, not having a good clue of what was going on because they had no experience with land ownership. Uh, so huge amounts of land transferred out of Indian ownership still within the confines of the reservation, but became fee simple land owned by non-Indians. That's your, uncle's, same that's time, your uncle's ranch, right? Yeah, exactly. Parts of it, but not all the ranch was, was fee simple. There were these individual trust lands out there where 
where they leased them from either individuals or the tribe. Uh, the, the Fort Peck reservation I keep coming back to because it's so fresh in my mind was 2.1 million acres. There were hardly, I don't know what the population of of the reservation was when it was created in the late 1800s, but you, if you allotted 160 acres to all the Indians, there was a lot of land left over. And it was declared surplus and hence open to homesteading. So more than half of the Fort Peck uh, two million acres is privately owned, and it was homesteaded by people who were coming out following the railroads, and and so many many reservations, almost all the big western ones, look like a piece of Swiss cheese where each of the holes is a a, a piece of trust land, and the rest of it is privately owned, and uh, that land is incredibly uh, productive. It's it's growing wheat, it's growing corn, uh, sugar beets, uh, and so on. Uh, so the, the tribal members ended up with ownership of some of the land, but certainly not all of it. They lost millions and millions of acres over time. Uh, and, and it's really conditioned how they worry about uh, 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 opening their land up to any kind of uh, ownership by other people to this very day. Uh, if you If you look at what happened to the reservations at that period of time, they went from from millions and millions of of, of acres to, to uh, just a, a few million acres. And, and that really has conditioned the way American Indians think today. Uh, I just was looking into my book at, for a couple of the numbers. If you, if, if you look at uh, total acres today uh, uh, on reservations, it's just a fraction of, of, of what it was, uh, of what is the entire reservation area. And in those situations where uh, white settlers bought land from or acquired land from uh, from from the Indians, they live peaceably, peacefully next to each other. There's no, you know, who's 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 in charge? Is it the is it the tribe? Is it the federal government? Is it the is there a police force? Is it the National Guard? I, I just don't have any idea. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm pretty ignorant. It, as, as this it, podcast reveals your your, your question reveals the the complexity of the institutions on reservations today, and and the difficulty of of moving forward out of this complex uh, set. So first, do people live peacefully next to one another? Sure. I mean, it, it, it there may be an occasional conflict of of somebody trespassing or or some such. Uh, uh, Offense, but by and large, uh, you're sitting there on one side of the fence with your fee simple, and the Native American is on the other side in this little parcel that uh, may have multiple, multiple owners. That's another part problem with these uh, allotted trust lands. They can't be uh, inherited other than uh, equal shares to all heirs. Some of these lands now have have literally thousands of owners, and they're 160 acres, so pretty hard to get everybody to agree what to do. But Terry, so that people one, sec, live real one sec, Terry. When you say fee simple, that's really what you, you and I in modern times would call property. It, the, yeah. My house is fee simple, meaning I own it. <clears throat> I can keep people off my property. I can sell it. I have all the normal rights that we associate with private property, Correct. Correct. Just for listeners, in fact, not not, comfortable, that's how not I aware of that to, term. To know, yeah, that's how I came to know about this. I was visiting a an Indian on the Flathead Reservation here in Montana, and and we were taking some Swiss people to visit this person, and and uh, I was explaining to the Swiss people that you know it's likely to be a substandard house, poor poor care of the land and so on. We arrive and it's a beautiful home, nice car, library. And I've, uh, ultimately I said to the, to the member of the Salish Kootenai Confederated Tribes, uh, this is an anomaly. How do you explain it? And he leaned on his elbow and said, I own this place. And I said, but aren't we on the reservation? I, don't know. I own this place. And the third time when I asked a stupid question, he said, I own this place. And I said, like I own my house. And he said, yes. So that's the fee simple land, and and some of the land is owned by Indians, and they. Uh, my friend uh, that I mentioned before, Bill Yellowtail, he has a wonderful ranch on the Crow Reservation. So they live relatively peacefully. Uh, the big problem is that the tribal government has no control of the of of in any way of the private lands. They can't tax them. Uh, 
only the state within which the reservation sits can tax the private lands. So they can they don't have any tax base. There's a federal uh, police department, a Bureau of Indian Affairs police department. It it governs the the tr- crime on reservations. Uh, if there is a dispute on reservations, oftentimes it goes to a tribal court, and these tribal courts are are often very biased against non-Indian owners. Uh, my colleague and friend uh, Nick Parker, now at the University of Wisconsin, and I looked at at at, com- at we compared reservations that have their legal systems judicial systems run through state courts with reservations that have their judicial systems run through tribal courts. And our hypothesis was that you would get more of a rule of law out of these state courts. And what we found was incredibly more higher incomes, higher growth rates of incomes in the reservations that use state courts. And the argument we make is that this provides a legal system that allows people to interact better, uh, to contract with one another, and as a result of those contracts, uh, be able to make necessary investments to improve productivity. Uh, Today, American Indians, of course, can move off reservations as any time they wish, and many do. And it's almost a necessity to move off the reservation if you're going to be successful. Uh, if you stay on the reservation and don't have land, you have nothing. You you have no way to really make investments in 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 your allotted land, uh, and your human capital investments are are worth little on the reservation. So what you find is people moving away from reservations and and often finding unemployment if they move to big urban areas. But the the comparison of off-reservation Indian income with on-reservation is astounding. They're just much richer off-reservations. So there's a rich tradition of spirituality, uh, economic life, uh, <clears throat> all kinds of things for, for Native Americans that – some of which I assume they can still enjoy on the reservation, others they can't. So just to take an obvious example, uh, the Buffalo Drives, which uh, have some interesting property rights, uh, which I, in, when I was reading your work was intrigued by these. Uh, but it's well known that the, that the Indians would often herd large numbers of buffalo over cliffs um, – Th- that kind of economic activity isn't uh, – presumably isn't possible anymore. Um, a lot of what you know would would be traditional ways of interacting with the land are not possible. But I assume some are. Are, are people on the reservations leading, quote, traditional lives, meaning lifestyles and economic activity similar to what their ancestors did out of – Devotion, uh, love, who knows whatever the reasons are, and it might leave them poorer, but maybe they enjoy it. Others, I assume, can't do those things. They're going to be poor because there's just not those those choices available to them. What are your thoughts on that? I think that it, uh, maybe, maybe one could compare it to uh, – a, a Jewish family, or in my case, I grew up in a uh, with the Serbian relatives, and uh, uh, you know we would go to Serbian picnics, and we would we we celebrated the Orthodox uh, holidays uh, for Christmas and Easter. Uh, as as a kid, of course, you wanted two Christmases, so I got that. Uh, it's a deal, but the. That's a good. That was a great deal. Uh, that so so we had some of those traditions, and I I you know as I said, if you lived in a, a Jewish family, you can enjoy Jewish traditions. But 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 that was kind of inside the house, if you will, and then outside the house, you participated in the in the more uh, the larger open economy, and I think that's somewhat true for American Indians. Uh, uh, a couple of friends on the Crow Reservation still participate in in sun dances, a, a, a very spiritual and and very uh, uh, 
severe kind of, of, of deprivation. It's uh, days of, of fasting and and no water. And, and it used to be tying yourself, tethering yourself to a pole with skewers through your uh, skin and standing in the sun for long hours. They don't do that quite as much anymore. But these are, these are rituals that are very important and they're still practiced. But after that, it's back to life outside the house, if, if I can continue that analogy. And, it, and, and the question for tribal members is, what is there outside the house? Is there anything available? And, and only a few tribes have managed to uh, find ways of, of continuing uh, economic prosperity. But as you say, if, if your life was based on herding buffalo off of a cliff, uh, which was true of these nomadic uh, plains tribes, uh, that just isn't there anymore. You may have a buffalo herd, and, and again, some tribes have enough buffalo. They have uh, celebrations where they'll kill some buffalo and, and have a feast and, and do some of their dancing. And, and uh, you know, that the importance of those rituals can't be denied and, and, and become a, a part of what holds the social fabric of of a tribe or culture together. But beyond that, uh, it's a matter of finding ways to, to generate, uh, uh, income and wealth from the soil, from the energy, from the human capital, uh, and from whatever other resources are out there on a reservation. Well, I ask because I, you know, I, we've talked a lot in this program about, uh, poverty outside the United States and the third world and so-called third world. And, um, you know, I think there's a terrible tendency to romanticize primitive ways of life or traditional ways of life. At the same time, I don't want to underestimate the possibility that people are not totally driven by financial well-being, and there, a lot of people aren't driven by that at all, and might be relatively content to embrace a certain lifestyle uh, for other reasons that other benefits they get from it. Uh, the comfort of, of being part of a community, the comfort of doing things the way they've always been done. And I'm just curious, given that it's not that hard, it, it, it it's hard to leave a really poor country in Africa or South America. It's not that hard to leave the Indian reservation. And the fact that they're very poor or have very high unemployment, maybe that's okay with, with the people who stay there. Or is there more to the story? I think there's a, a bit more to the story. I, I first want to just uh, uh, reemphasize your point about the importance of these cultural uh, uh, norms and and uh, rituals. Uh, they are what bind society together. And and uh, whether it's uh, sitting around your dinner table having a prayer and and uh, teaching people thou shalt not steal uh those kinds of 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 cultural positions have an important part to play in in institutions and i you know we we economists uh, get some credit for having made this clear certainly nobel laureate uh, lynn ostrom for example or douglas north have have made that clear uh but but then beyond that is the question of of okay, can you can you live off of that uh, if you don't have the buffalo to drive over a cliff? And and there I think uh, yes, moving off the reservation is is part of the answer for some people. But I'm reminded of of the the notion of there being a poverty trap that that you're you're at a a low level and and you can't you can't really get out of that without some major step upward. And in the case of of, of American Indians. There's a significant amount of welfare flowing, welfare type payments flowing into reservations through the various agencies that that uh, 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 govern reservations. The Bureau of Indian Affairs has 9,000 employees. They spend 2.9 billion dollars every year. Uh, each bureaucrat has 322 Indians, uh, and uh, they spend about a thousand dollars on every Indian. Uh, they spend more on education uh, than on Indian reservations per student than we do off. Twenty thousand on reservations, twelve thousand off. Uh, so there's uh, so if you're on a reservation, you're getting some of these benefits. You're, you you get some subsidized housing, uh, and 
and to then say, well, let me move off. You have to be able to say, wow, to what? I've, yeah. I've got a college education and, you know, I, I can really move off the reservation, leave my family and uh, make a lot of income. And, and for most of them, they don't have the education and uh, that that poverty trap, that wall that they have to climb over is so high that they just stay. And so when I was making the remark about, you know, maybe they're better off in poor countries with their current lifestyle, the, the part that I think it's important to emphasize is that there are people who argue that it's better to be poor because you're not uh, susceptible to the evils of Western capitalism and Western uh, materialism. You know, you heard the same things about uh, Elian Gonzalez when we returned – we when the U.S. government returned Elian Gonzalez to Cuba – uh, there were actually commentators who said that's good for for him because now he won't have to grow up in Western uh, materialism. And I think that's probably a choice that most people would prefer. Uh, they certainly show that they prefer by risking their lives to come here. And they come here, of course, for all kinds of reasons beyond the material. Uh, but I think they're, in, they're interwoven. I think the opportunity to express oneself and have a life of meaning often comes from how you spend your time in the day outside the rituals and family, et cetera, what we call work. So I don't want to, I don't want to be misunderstood when I was saying that, you know, people on the reservation, uh, obviously since they stay there, they must be better off. Well, they are in some sense, but uh, I don't, it's, I say that not because I romanticize um, poverty versus say Western uh, standard levels of Western standards of living. So I just want to make that clear. Uh, so how many programs are there in the Bureau of Indian Affairs that are um, specifically f for for Indians rather than off-reservation folks? Can people on reservations, do they get food stamps? Do they get standard uh, welfare programs available to across the country? And do they have their own programs that other people aren't uh, eligible for? Oh, they have they have everything and then some. Uh, they have uh, huge amounts of housing subsidies. I already mentioned the education expenditures are are almost twice what they are uh, from the federal government. Almost twice what they are off reservations. They have the the Indian Health Service, a very a completely separate health system. Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, it's, it's good in some places, bad in others, uh, has a reputation as not providing the best uh, health care, but, but they have an Indian health service. They have an Indian police force. Uh, they, they have, uh, all manner of, of, uh, investment programs available to tribes, uh, trying to start, as I mentioned, the electronics firm, the Crow uh, tried to start a carpet factory. Uh, uh, reservation after reservation has its own uh, effort to uh, make these kinds of investments. So uh, I, I can't give you an exact number, but but you take you take housing, healthcare, uh, capital investment, uh, uh, education, and and it's huge amounts of money that flow into these reservations, and and therein I think lies part of the problem for how you get. Uh, how how people somehow uh, are able to 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 unlock the wealth of Indian nations, as I titled the book I recently edited, and and the problem is that if if you're a tribal elder, uh, you're a tribal chairman, and you're the one who allocates all of the all of the welfare that's coming in, then you have a lot of power, and if somehow the tribe is able to uh, uh, pull out of this the red tape that it's wrapped in as a result of all of these various programs. Uh, it means that you may have less power, uh, and therein lies the the real uh, I think problem of of how to unlock the wealth of Indian nations. Well, some of that wealth is human capital, the entrepreneurial and innovative uh, temperament that is still there, but presumably is being uh, handicapped by property rights. Not being as available as the other as they could be, um, well, and I and I I would I would uh, should add that uh, in the last couple of decades we've opened uh, tribal colleges on virtually every reservation and uh, in an effort to try to increase the human capital available to uh, Native Americans without them having to leave the uh, 
a reservation and come to some university town where they uh, are quite unfamiliar with the culture and and uh, lifestyle. So uh, we've we've made those investments in human capital, but the question is, what do you do with human capital once you have it? I might just note there's a, a group of Indians. They're not a recognized tribe uh, in in North Carolina uh, called the Lumbees, and the the Lumbee Indians are noted for their entrepreneurship. Uh, a good friend Ben Chavis, who's uh, written a book uh, called Crazy Like a Fox, and and it's about his entrepreneurial efforts. And and you you talk to the Lumbees, and and you know they they are truly capitalists. Uh, but they don't have a reservation. They don't have all of this welfare because they're not uh, 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 a recognized tribe. Uh, and they utilize the system, but they maintain many of their cultural roots as well. So it's an example of of, of a group of Indians who who are able to have their cake and eat it too of sorts. Well, your remark about education, colleges on, on the reservation reminds me tragically of increases in Efforts to educate uh, poor people outside the United States, again, in the, in the third world. And um, we often find no relationship between levels of education and, and economic well-being in poor countries because, as you say, there's just not much to do with it if you stay where you are. If you left, you could maybe do something productive um, if that's if that's what you wanted. But l- let's um, let's talk about the handicaps facing, um, or let me say it better. Let's talk about what might be changed uh, on reservations today with respect to government policy and why that might make things better if uh, things were different. So right now, one of the obvious examples you talk about in your work is um, control and access to natural resources is is highly limited. Are there other changes that you would recommend that we make? Talk about what that in particular, and then maybe other things you think are important. Mm-hmm. Back to the, this whole notion of trusteeship, uh, that, that, in my opinion, is, is probably the biggest hurdle to unlocking the wealth of, of, of Indian nations, especially, again, the Western reservations. Uh, and, and I might just note that it is not saying give them more uh, opportunity for gaming, for casinos. Uh, that's, it only works in urban areas. And uh, and Ron Johnson, an economist uh, friend of mine, has written about uh, what happens when tribes are really successful with gaming. And the, the the answer is the state says we want to share, and they either get the tribes to contribute parts of their profits to to the state, or they open up casinos to compete with them. So it you know that kind of thing is not the answer to wealth. Uh, Trusteeship is is what wraps these reservations in a, a red tape that keeps them from developing land and resources and and somehow uh, getting the federal government to relinquish the trusteeship is important. Let me use the example of the of Flathead Reservation here in Montana, where they used a, a special law to uh, basically wrest control of their uh, uh, timber resources from the federal government. They manage their own timber. Uh, we did a study here at PERC comparing their management with neighboring U.S. Forest Service management. For every dollar the Forest Service spent, they basically broke even, and that's because it's a really productive forest. Usually they lose. The tribe, however, was earning $2 for every dollar it spent. It had better timber. It had better age distribution of the timber. It had better species distribution of timber. It had better water quality, better wildlife habitat. It beat the federal government on every count. And the reason was that the tribe had control. It was like private ownership in a sense. In this case, it was it was communal for the tribe. Uh, and they were able to manage it quite well. So I think there's there are ways that tribes can get out of this trusteeship. And when they do, the evidence is they do quite well. Uh, The Crow tribe has the biggest coal reserves in the United States. They are the richest coal owner in the United States. And yet they have trouble developing their coal for two reasons. One, they have to overcome all of these, these trust requirements that the federal government puts upon them. And two, they can't export their coal because in their case, uh, the Lummi, not the Lumbee, but the Lummi Indians in Washington oppose construction of a coal export terminal. So you've got tribe against tribe. Uh, 
so this trusteeship is probably the most onerous part. If you look at the Fort Berthold Reservation in North Dakota, right in the center of the Bakken play and as, as the fracking was booming, they had nothing going on. I have a GIS map uh, showing where wells were drilled. None were on the, on the Fort Berthold Reservation until a law was passed that allowed them to get out from under 49 different regulations that controlled what they could do with their oil and gas. Once that passed, the reservation flourished with with oil wells or fracking wells being drilled, and they made millions and millions of dollars. Uh, Darren Old Coyote, the chairman of the Crow Tribe, uh, says that the war on coal is a war on his families and his people. And he says that because, again, it is regulating the, their ability to take uh, to, to use their resources. So I, I think the first step is to somehow get the government to federal government out of the constraints it puts on tribes and let the tribes decide. There's an effort in Canada, for example, for each reservation to simply decide, does it want the federal government out and does it want to take uh, responsibility for managing its lands, for having free, uh, having uh, fee ownership on its lands? Uh, and and doing it reservation by reservation. If you want to stay under this system that exists by this proposed legislation in Canada, your tribe decides to stay under. My tribe decides to st- to get out. It's a, it would be a great test of just how important uh, uh, flexibility and and essentially a kind of federalism is to a devolving authority back to tribes. But all that can only work if tribes can understand how to run their governments. And that's certainly not, uh, we know that at the, at the federal level in the United States and, and a few states as well. It's not easy to create a government based on rule of law that's fiscally responsible. And uh, I've been working with some tribes here in the U.S., with some Maori, the natives in New Zealand, and, and with some bands in Canada to create a consortium for developing a framework for tribal leaders to understand essentially what the Federalist paper said. And I, I think that uh, getting the federal government out is a start, but then tribal governments have to be, uh, uh, have to find ways of, of managing their uh, affairs in a, in a way that is consistent with expanding the pie, not just for the government, but for the tribal members themselves. One thing that strikes me listening to this, I mean, you said at the beginning it's a small population, but three million people is not – that's the number of American Indians. It's not that small a number. Uh, certainly it's not that small a number out west where population is lower. It's surprising to me that – maybe I've missed it. I don't see a lot of traction for these kind of issues in in elections or in, maybe it just doesn't get reported on. Uh, you'd think there would be a lot of uh, demand – for getting rid of this kind of paperwork and red tape that's that's hampering development for the people who live there and who could prosper at least financially, maybe not necessarily employment, but certainly financially from selling rights to access to these natural resources in local elections, uh, congressional elections. Are these issues that that arise? Almost never. Uh, I, I as you were making that uh, point. Uh, I remember that President Obama came and visited some of the reservations in Montana and, and you know, and, and it was an important time and he he participated in some of the the rituals they had and was made a, a, a member of, of the Crow tribe, I believe it was. Uh, and that gate got them some attention. But after that, you know, it kind of fizzled. There was not a lot of attention paid. I think it's it's partly that these these populations, if it were three million people in one location, they'd have a lot to, they'd have a lot of power and they'd make their point. But when you have just a few hundred here and a few thousand there, uh, I think five thousand on the Fort Peck reservation, if I recall, uh, these populations are so small that they and and even if they were well organized as a as a as a Crow tribe or a Northern Cheyenne tribe. Uh, or a Sioux tribe, they they they're just small in that way, and and then getting them organized as a whole group is really difficult. Uh, I mentioned the the Canadian effort; uh, they have a, a a national organization of of uh, First Nations, as they're called up there, and and they are hardly a single voice. So 
I think I think it's just a t- typical collective action problem. You you have a, a hard time getting these three million people together, uh, getting your agreement, and their voices don't get heard. And then that's competing with a, a well organized bureaucracy in D.C. for sure, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Department of Interior. Uh, some housing uh, monies and so on, and a pretty well organized uh, uh, tribal leadership in many cases uh, through which this uh, money from Washington flows. And so you've got to somehow overcome on the one side the hurdles created by these, I'll call them special interests, and on the other side organize the people who are, uh, are, are poor as a result of these kinds of controls. Well, you mentioned a lot of money flowing into the reservations, but if it's three billion people and three billion dollar budget for the Bureau of two point nine for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, it's only about a thousand dollars per person. Is it because that that's a lot of money when you're poor, or is it there are other monies that and other effects that that we're not talking about when we just look at say the Bureau of Indian Affairs budget? Yeah, it, it, it's partly that it is a lot of money. I mean, you're talking. About- Per capita income of five thousand dollars, one thousand of that is is twenty percent. That's that, that's significant, yeah. but that number doesn't include the the, the housing uh, that's built on reservation. It doesn't include all of the uh, in, uh, investment. I, I was going to use the word debacles that happen. Uh, so it, it's it's far more than that. What's interesting too, though, is that if you look at at reservations and be, uh, I keep harping on the crow because I was just there this summer and visited their coal mine and talked to their tribal leaders. Uh, you know, they, they, they don't develop as much coal as they'd like to or as they could, but they're still uh, taking in, I think that the tribal members get a check for $400 every three months or something like that, if my recollection is correct. Uh, so, you know, they are getting some revenue off of their coal and it comes back to the people. Uh, but the problem is, back to what we've talked about, what do you do? You just got a check for $400. What are you going to do with it living on the reservation? You don't have any land you can invest it in. You can't go out and uh, you know, use it to help pay off the tractor that you just purchased to plow your field because you don't have a tractor. And you can't borrow the money to get a tractor because you don't have any collateral to put up. You don't own the land. It's in trust. And so this money gets spent on consumer goods. And as a... Uh, uh, Darren Old Coyote, the chairman, said, he said, you know, we get these checks, and first thing that happens is they run to Billings, Montana, 60 miles away, buy a new car, and trash the one they had. And uh, that's what happens over and over where there are these uh, resources that could help generate wealth for for the, the rightful owners. So let's close with a question that crosses my mind. It's a, kind of a strange way to think about it, but when you tell me that they're the these large tracts of land out west where it's really hard to develop stuff and where natural resources are kind of trapped in, under the under the surface of the earth and um, there's not a lot of economic activity generally. That would also describe national parks uh, more or less. I mean we have different, different types of government and federal land out west, but nat- national parks certainly have the most constraints. And, and most people say, well, that's what's great about them. You might not want to live there. You only want to visit. Uh, so I understand that people might not want to live on reservations, but um, or there's negatives about it. But it just strikes me that there's a, a tourism opportunity here. I assume many of these lands are very beautiful. Is is there anything happening there? Is it? I never heard. I've never heard of anyone say, "Come visit the such and such reservation." It's a great way to spend your summer vacation. You, maybe for you, Terry, you're an economist. You don't count. Uh, but for normal people. Uh, people unlike you and me are not so interested in incentives and property rights and, and uh, the wealth of nations. Um, why isn't there more tourism, or is there some that I don't know about? Well, there is some. Uh, I, I would start by true confessions as to why I was visiting the Fort Peck Reservation, for example. It wasn't purely to do studies. Uh, I was there pheasant hunting, and uh, uh, I paid their one hundred and eighty dollar. Uh, license fee to hunt for five days. Uh, so there is that kind of tourism, some hunting tourism. But let me let me switch to a, a tribe that's that's taking advantage of the tourism very very well, and it's the uh, White Mountain Apache Reservation in northern Arizona. Uh, they have a ski run, runs for a profit, provides great skiing for people from Phoenix. They manage their own elk herd. They have the largest elk in the United States. If you want to shoot a big trophy to hang on your wall, wall 
go to the White Mountain Apache. You'll be paying somewhere around $20,000 for your five-day hunt, and maybe it's even more than that today. Uh, and that money goes goes to pay for cooks and guides and and uh, various people who, who serve the hunting camps. Uh, they have uh, uh, several lakes on the reservation. You can rent a lake for your family reunion. They have cabins. Uh, and they're a reservation that's doing quite well because, again, they've They've managed to get control out of the hands of the federal government and into the hands of tribal leaders who understand how to create a government that works and how to create enterprise through private ownership and, and through, through government ownership or tribal ownership, if you will, uh, that is, is well managed. So uh, there are tribes that are doing this. Uh, the uh, uh, Flathead here in Montana near Glacier Park are trying to capitalize on on their ownership of flat along parts of Flathead Lake, a spectacular lake uh, near Glacier. Uh, so there are tribes that have these resources. Uh, the Crow Tribe now is organizing some buffalo hunts, uh, and you can go out in a real wild setting and hunt buffalo with the with a Native American. Uh, so there's there's bits and pieces of this happening. Uh, and I think more and more of it will happen if tribal governments see the opportunity to manage that kind of a resource, that recreational resource in a way that, that uh, really provides them an opportunity to capitalize on it while preserving it. My guest today has been Terry Anderson. Terry, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Oh, Russ, it's always a great pleasure. I might close with just my favorite quote from Chief Joseph, uh, a famous uh, Nez Perce chief uh, who was chased into Canada uh, in 1879. He said, let me be a free man, free to travel, free to stop, free to work, free to trade where I choose, free to follow the religion of my fathers, free to walk, think, and act for myself. That's the kind of thing that Chief Joseph wanted, and it's what I think we owe uh, Native Americans who, who deserve the kind of freedoms you and I can enjoy. Couldn't agree more. Thank you, Terry. My pleasure. Thanks, Russ. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.